I'll try and uh, <clears throat> make this entertaining. It's, it's a bit of a voyage of, of discovery uh, I'm going to take you on. Um, it's a little different to the previous talks. I'm going to talk about uh, kind of my journey, if you like, in, in trying to solve a very complex neurologic disease and uh, trying to understand what its uh, etiology is, trying to model that, and trying to lower the bar for pharmaceutical investment uh, to try and do something about it. So it's a bit of a personal journey. The, um, <clears throat> this is where I start. So every summer I used to work. My mum was a cleaner in this hospital. It's a, a psychiatric institution. It's in the middle of Dartmoor. It's closed down now. It's uh, luxury apartments. But at the time, um, it used to house many, many, many patients with a variety of different uh, neurologic and psychiatric conditions. So it was everything from children, uh, uh, with, for example, with autism, autism spectrum kind of disorders, uh, teenagers with schizophrenia, uh, to the oldest psychogeriatrics with, with dementia. And every summer I used to hang out in this hospital and I used to, because, you know, that's where my mum put me when she was busy and, and, uh, and I used to see, I said, well, what's the standard of care here for these patients? I mean, what options do they have? What, what options do the physicians have who are treating them? And you know what the options are? Have a guess. Sedation. That's about it. Really, there isn't very much in the way of therapeutics. Uh, it's, you know, you, uh, you enter this institution, you never leave it. Right? There was only one escape, and that was the, uh, uh, the Intercity 125 railway track that ran by, and the patients occasionally would escape and throw themselves in front of a train. You know? So that's where I started out, and I thought to myself, well, to understand the brain and understand the mind and understand these neurologic conditions, there's got to be a way in. It's very difficult to get a brain biopsy, right, because nobody wants to give it up, at least not while they're living. Um, so one way to, to do that is obviously through DNA. And um, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to go about this. I'm going to start working in DNA and, uh, and see if I can figure out the basis of some of these neurologic conditions. Um, so this is where I work now, this building, and uh, we're up on the fifth floor. The, uh, my interest really has developed around uh, movement disorders for the most part, and, and Parkinson's disease is what I'm going to talk to you about. I, I do also work in pediatric seizure disorders. I, I'm doing neonatal screening in intensive care units and things like this, and, and uh, we do a number of different things. Um, but I give you this analogy of a motor, all right, because I'm going to talk about movement disorders. The principal problem for me is that we don't understand for so many of these psychiatric and neurologic conditions uh, what the components are of the, of the mind, of the brain. And we certainly don't understand how they fit together. Our understanding of neuroscience is so rudimentary. It's amazing to me how, how, how far we've managed to progress knowing so little. And every, every day I go to work, I discover something new and something more fundamental. It's even more of an eye-opener. But anyway, I, I, uh, I give you this analogy because the first thing I think we need to do is understand the component parts. And genetics is a great way of doing that, using family-based genetics or, fa or population-based genetics. You can understand and identify these very specific component parts of this engine, and then maybe we can figure out how those components fit together to try and solve the problem and try and find interventions that actually might be of benefit rather than just uh, trial and error. The lab, uh, we engaged in a number of different things. It's quite a large team. Um, we don't do particularly much in the way of uh, neurology and neuropathology. I always say to people, I know just enough neurology to be dangerous to a patient. So, uh, <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk to you about some, of, um, some neurological aspects of, of Parkinson's disease. I focus a lot on population genetics, family genetics as you go around, and then taking those um, mutations that we discover and putting them into mouse models. And I, I try and really focus on physiology. Uh, so try and do very subtle manipulations of the mouse genome, just a single nucleotide change, and, uh, and, th and then work up the biology of that using very, very um, uh, subtle tools, mostly electrophysiology. And combining that uh, electrophysiology, often uh, living brain slice electrophysiology, um, uh, with, with pharmacology, and of course taking that back to patients and thinking about um, uh, PET scan. There's a big, uh, there's a big PET center um, at, at our institution. So in terms of the etiology of Parkinson's disease, it's really come on a long way. Uh, you may know it well as a, as a movement disorder. Uh, shaking palsy was actually de uh, first described 200 years ago this year. Um, it's been 50 years uh, since high-dose levodopa was prescribed. 
Um, has anyone seen the movie Awakenings? I'm not sure if you have, but it's a wonderful movie. Robert De Niro and, uh, and Robin Williams. And basically, it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a movie about uh, the, the first applications of levodopa in patients with um, post-syphilitic Parkinsonism. But the success really has come in the last 20 years. It's 20 years since the first gene for Parkinson's disease was described. And I'm going to tell you about my journey in this. Parkinson's disease uh, is typically thought of as a late onset disorder. Median age of onset is around 70 years of age. And it's an umbrella term, like so many of the diseases that we study, cancer, for example. But we really, we appreciate all of these disorders, although it's an umbrella term, it's actually a variety of different um, diseases in a, in, a, in a sense. Each patient with Parkinson's disease, many of my neurology colleagues tell me, each patient that they see is unique. Every single one is unique. All right? and, um, and in part, it's because you know, there's 20,000, whatever, 390 genes. There's lots of environmental contributions. There's this 70 years of, of, of gene-environment interaction going on. And, and sure enough, um, uh, patients manifest differently. Um, the underlying etiologies may be different, and the symptoms may be masked, may be compensated for, and that compensation is also different, and how that compensation fails with time is also different, which is why patients manifest symptoms differently too. But there's many different types. I'm going to talk mostly about, um, well, I'm going to talk about all of them, really. It's a disease of the, um, uh, what's classic and, and well known about it is it's the loss of, of neurons in the black substance in the substantia nigra of the brain, and it's the loss of their innovation, the dopaminergic innovation um, to the striatum, really, that's the, uh, uh, that leads to the movement disorder. In terms of um, genome-wide association studies, this has been done uh, uh, probably since the, the mid-2000s. We're up to about 41 loci that are now published, 41 positions in the genome um, uh, that basically contribute to Parkinson's disease. The odds ratio for the most recent 17 loci published are typically in the order of about 0.1. Uh, so it's very small effects, and the loci tend to be fairly large. They tend to encompass more than one gene, although they're labeled by a single gene name. Um, and all of the, uh, the variability within each locus, of course, is in, in, in some disequilibrium. So it's very hard to say what the actual um, pathogenic mutation is, if there is such a pathogenic mutation that is contributing to risk at any of these loci. Um, so this is an example here. You can see um, the, that's high frequency in terms of uh, uh, the variability and, uh, and, the, and the odds ratios are in red there are, are, are rather marginal. Uh, nevertheless, um, genome-wide association studies and findings from population, for, uh, sorry, from, from family-based studies have, have coincided and concur around some of those genes. And one of the first genes, that were the first gene that was mapped was alpha-synuclein in, uh, in 1997. And we contributed uh, uh, the uh, synuclein multiplication uh, mutations in, in 2003. This is a family shown here that was studied by Mayo Clinic since 1924, and I had the privilege to work with all the family members and basically collect blood samples and um, go around the states, and, and basically we ended up um, mapping the multiplication. It was a 1.7 uh, megabase uh, triplication on the mutant allele. You can see there's some interface fish, and, and um, in the bottom uh, corner there, it's a blue stained dappy nucleus, and the interface fish uh, very clearly shows four signals uh, for the four copies that are found in these uh, patients. The mean age of onset in the family is about 33 years of age for Parkinson's disease, and the mean duration to death is about 14 years, and all of these patients um, go downhill rather rapidly and, and develop cognitive impairment and dementia before they die. Um, we understand now there's many synuclein triplication mutations. Triplication, we call them because three copies on the mutant allele. There's also synuclein duplication mutations and there's point mutation. There's several hundreds of these families around the world. And, um, and of course, alpha-synuclein has been recognized now as the pathologic hallmark of the condition. So um, other than just the loss of nigral neuronal, nigral neurons, you also see um, uh, proteinaceous inclusions that light up very nicely with alpha-synuclein antibodies. Um, um, we've dissected this locus in the sense that we've basically done some uh, uh, custom capture and high-throughput sequencing in around 2,000 subjects. Long story short, we find uh, evidence for, for variability um, contributing to Parkinsonism at one end of the gene and 
evidence of genetic variability, different independent genetic variability, contributing to dementia at the other end of the gene. So it's very nice that these loci, you know, you can further dissect with, with uh, next-gen approaches. Um, one of the things that's most remarkable in our study, though, is we actually found a, an expanded, I don't have, uh, I do have a pointer, but it doesn't really matter too much. We did actually find um, an expanded tetranucleotide repeat that actually contributes to uh, Parkinson's disease dementia, early dementia in the context of Parkinsonism, and um, which, of course, we didn't find through the next-gen sequencing, but it was pinned down through that, through that variability. Um, there are right now a number of different... Uh, um, Drug trials going on. Uh, go there and the, there's a variety of companies who are targeting alpha synuclein as a, as, a, as a gene and its deposition in the terms in the form of Lewy bodies and trying to remove either trying to prevent that uh, protein being produced in the first place or trying to remove that pathology uh, using immune-based approaches. And you can see here just a couple of reviews um, saying the battle begins as these companies vie up together to try and. Uh, do their clinical trials. Um, the problem is they're really focused on pathology and they're really focused on removing the alpha synuclein. And to my mind, although the synuclein multiplication family is an example, an extreme example, to my mind, uh, most of that synuclein pathology, uh, while it might contribute to the disease's uh, ontology, uh, it may not necessarily be etiologic. It may be a consequence of the condition rather than a cause. And I give you this slide here as an illustration. This is actually from work around a, a, a um, GDNF trial using um, an analog of GDNF, neutrin, and, and putting that into the brain using AAV2. One of the big things about the trial that was w wonderful was that the AAV2, the um, delivery was safe and tolerable and non-toxic, but had no efficacy. Putting growth factor basically back into the striatum to try and cause sprouting of uh, axonal terminals, of dopaminergic terminals in the striatum, um, failed in the trial because the vast majority of patients, by the time they were entered into the trial, they were, these patients were selected to be about three or four years into their disease. They're quite stably medicated on levodopa. By the time they're engaged in the trial, I should use this, why not? Um, by the time they're engaged in the trial, they basically didn't have anything left to sprout. Right? <laughs> so this is the staining of TH, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase immunoactivity. It's a marker for, for dopaminergic terminals in the striatum. And, you know, this is a patient with Parkinson's disease four years into their condition. Um, so that's, it failed. So one of the challenges for us, of course, is predicting and then preventing. You've got to predict it early. You've got to predict it in patients even before they become symptomatic. And then you've got to intervene. And it's the same problem with dementia, for example, with Alzheimer's disease. Same problem with a lot of neurologic conditions. Um, we, um, through various uh, um, studies, this is some family-based studies that uh, I was involved in in the early 2000s. We mapped uh, another major gene for Parkinson's disease, known as leucine rich repeat kinase 2. It's here on chromosome 12. And it turned out to be what we call the Rosetta Stone of Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is associated with Lewy body disease. It's associated with tangles in some patients, neurofibrillary tangles. And it's associated with dyscoliosis and nigral neuronal loss in others. And in this particular uh, gene, uh, um, in, this, in these families, for example, here with family A, they have an, um, a Y1699C mutation. Family D has an R1441C mutation. Um, and they have dominant uh, late-onset Parkinson's disease clinically, segregating down the family line very, very nicely, as you can see, dominant pattern of inheritance. And yet when the autopsies, when, for example, four autopsies, uh, four people donated their brains uh, from this particular pedigree, and they had pleomorphic pathologies. So some patients had uh, Lewy body pathology, some patients had uh, tauopathy, and some patients just had nigral neuronal loss and, and gliosis. And, uh, and no other pathologies. So we saw different end-stage neurodegenerative pathologies in the same uh, family with the same underlying disease mutation. Uh, the, um, we looked at LERC2 extensively. Um, we found, for example, this is a study looking at genetic variability within the LERC2 gene itself in many, many uh, subjects, 6,000 patients and about 6,000 controls, looking at 121 coding changes within LERC2. We find that there's both, um, this is a haplotype that's um, inversely associated with these, disease. And we also find this particular mutation here, G2385R, which probably has the greatest population attributable risk of any LERC2 mutations. We find, we find this mutation um, 
We described it in 2005 first. This is a 2007 study, uh, basically uh, from Taiwan. But the mutation is found at 8% frequency across Asia. So 8% of the patients who have Parkinson's disease in Asia have a LERC2 G2385R mutation. And one of the challenges for us um, using rare Mendelian genetics was how to generalize this to the idiopathic disease and how to lower the bar for pharmaceutical companies to get invested. You know, I say to them, you need to make a, a drug for LERC2. And they say to me, why? You know, we've got to get some... We've got to get a return on our investment. Show, show us that this is generalizable. Show us that you can basically, um, uh, that this is going to be a benefit to Parkinson's patients worldwide. And I think this, this example here shows them that they will get a return on their investment. Um, the, uh, the most common mutation, though, for, in LERC2 that we found, um, this is a friend of mine, Jan. He, uh, we were fishing for, uh, for, for trout, but we're also fishing for families on, on the uh, the central northern coasts of Norway, and we found uh, a series of families that actually linked together uh, back to the 15th century now, we realize, to, to one pedigree. And uh, um, the mutation is here. It's a G2019S change uh, in the hinge of the activation segment of the kinase. Basically what it does, it breaks open this ribbon of protein that normally blocks the active site of LERC2 and keeps it constitutively ajar. And one of the things that was... Um, uh, immediately sprung to my mind is if we use a competitive kinase inhibitor uh, in uh, heterozygotes with this particular mutation, we have the potential there that we may be able to stop or halt their disease progression, perhaps even when they're asymptomatic. So it's going ahead. One of the things we noted about that particular mutation is that uh, as, as I went down through uh, for countries from, from Norway down through uh, Spain, my graduate student at the time was from Spain and he brought samples from Spain, um, we found that the frequency of G2019S increased. And uh, so much so that I ended up doing, I've ended up doing a lot of work in Tunis and Tunisia over the last 10 years. Uh, we find that one in three patients with Parkinson's disease who comes in the clinic in Tunisia has a G2019S mutation. Uh, the odds ratios for disease are about tenfold. So this is a Mendelian mutation, segregates down the family line. The penetrance is ethnic specific, and I'll show you that in a minute. We actually find, um, and this has been... Many other papers have come out. Uh, so, for instance, in North African Arabs, it's 30% in Berbers. Uh, in idiopathic disease, if you have family history, it's 40%. And in Ashkenazi Jewish patients with Parkinson's disease, about 14% um, frequency. We think it was contributed by the, um, I should have, should have said, by uh, Phoenician trading and, uh, uh, between Norway and, and the Mediterranean as well. And it's the same founder mutation. Everybody who has G2019S basically is a is a cousin, <laughs> ancestrally speaking, <laughs> um, which is quite remarkable given the number. Uh, the penetrance is, is ethnic specific. These are uh, Israeli Jews and, um, and uh, Berber Arabs from Tunisia here. These are Norwegians. Uh, basically, this is Kaplan Meyer, clinic-based populations. But you can see the, um, uh, the cumulative incidence, the penetrance, if you like, with age. And there's a big shift, a big difference between Norwegians and um, and Berbers. Maybe, maybe it's eating salmon that makes the difference. I don't know. Fish oil, perhaps. I don't know. Um, we, um, we've gone on in Tunisia to work with something in the order of 1,000 uh, heterozygotes, uh, 41 families, 41 extensive families, to try and map a modifier of LERC2 that regulate, well, helps uh, contribute to age of onset. So rather than looking at Parkinson's disease or not Parkinson's disease as a trait, we looked at age of onset. Um, and the study we used uh, was a family-based linkage approach and then went on to use um, uh, genome-wide arrays and uh, whole genome imputation and, uh, and, and then was replicated in an independent um, series, um, a couple of independent series. Uh, cut a long story short, we find a signal here on chromosome 1 and it uh, modifies age of onset by about 12 years, depending on the variability that you've inherited in another gene here called Dynamin 3. Um, Dynamin 3 helps regulate the, uh, uh, the relationship between philopodia and mushroom-shaped spines in, in, in neurons, and, um, but really um, an awful lot more work needs to be done on this. Um, moving uh, on, I wanted to understand, so finding a gene for me isn't satisfactory enough. I want to do something about it. I mean, uh, my former mentor said to me, Matt, uh, you know, you find a gene, you move on, that's somebody else's worry. 
let the pharma companies worry about it, let the uh, biologists worry about it. But I found that none of the above uh, were really doing the types of studies I thought were necessary. So, for instance, if you go to a movement disorders conference right now and listen to what they've got to say about disease etiology, you'll hear a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion about immunology. And um, you'll hear very little studies uh, being done or news about, um, about uh, the neurons per se or work going on, uh, in vivo work going on in, in brain in the context of these different mutations. It's quite surprising, really. So one of the things that we did is, is we've taken G2019S, we've made knock-in animals, we've made knockouts, we've made back-over expresses, and we've done the comparative physiology of those animals with very large N, looking basically at the striatum and looking at the... Um, the cortical and, and the dopaminergic inputs to the striatum, and, and measuring in those animals just differences between them. There's a pub publication just came out in eLife. Um, uh, one of the things we find in, these particular, in this particular model, so for example here, we find that there's basically, um, this is G2019S knock-in mice versus their wild-type litter mates. And we find basically there's... Um, there's differences in the probability of, of, of release. This is actually glutamatergic release uh, into the striatum from the cortex. And um, there's a differences between the knock-in mice and the wild-type mice. Um, and it's a much bigger, with age, there's a much bigger decrement um, in, the, uh, in the G2019S mice. Basically, the candle's burning uh, twice as bright, half as long. Uh, there's this excessive excitability, if you like, of, of, uh, um, of a whole variety of different uh, neuronal populations, if you like, and, um, and that, uh, that basically is, is causing uh, an accelerated synaptic senescence in, in, in those animals. There are a number of drugs for LERC2 now that are going into clinical trials uh, at the moment. They're all based on basically uh, competitive kinase in inhibition, which is nice, and they all lower, uh, many of them lower LERC2 levels as well. The... Uh, <coughs> The challenge is how to see target engagement and how to, um, and to measure efficacy. Um, one of the ways of doing that probably is through uh, for using PET scans and looking at 18 fluidopa turnover. This is some recent data looking at 18 fluidopa turnover in striatum of patients uh, and of carriers or heterozygotes with low tg 2019 s um, But it's still a, a very, it's a big challenge to do this, I think, because of uh, not, not every PET center is, is cut out to do it. It's very expensive. Um, I can talk about more, more of that later. The, um, but I want to move on to comparative exome analysis. So one of the things that we started championing back in about 2008 was to use exome sequencing uh, within families and just compare, uh, say, cousins who are affected and, and basically look at their, um, the variability that they share. And it's a very simple technique to do, to look at the intersection between exomes of affected subjects. And sure enough, we mapped using this... Um, uh, in this particular family, a new gene for Parkinson's disease known as uh, uh, vacuola protein sorting 35, and, um, and a particular mutation, D620N. BPS35 here, it's part of a, uh, a machinery, basically, that um, allows um, protein sorting, membrane protein sorting in endosomes. Um, best described between endosomes and the, uh, and the Golgi, but also has a major role in neurons, we've now learnt, uh, between endosomes and the plasma lemma. It basically recycles a lot of uh, neurotransmitter receptors. Um, uh, the uh, VPS35 binds 26, 29, forms this tubular-like structure, as you can see them here, recruits wash complex to form patches of branch actin uh, that basically coalesce the protein cargos that are trafficked uh, in these, what these become vesicles. Um, so <clears throat> one of the challenges here is if you mess with the stoichiometry of the complex, you mess with everything. Uh, it's a big problem. You end up killing or getting rid of half the synapses in, 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 your, in your culture systems or in your model. Um, so we had to make a, a knock-in, so we've made very simple knock-ins. Uh, um, I won't go into the details too much, but um, I just wanted to show you some of the biology. Um, the motor beha behavior of the mice, and this is using pretty large N and looking at open field and cylinder tests and accelerating rotor rod tests, there's no motor phenotype in the animals. Right, it's pretty. I mean, maybe that's not surprising. Mice live to two years of age. You need to be 70 as a Parkinson's patient to get the disease. Um, there are some cognitive phenotypes, and they do seem dose responsive, uh, allelic uh, dose responsive, I should say, and that they're more excessive in the homozygous animals compared to heterozygous compared to wild type. It's an anxiety-like phenotype, but 
won't go into that too much. But one thing we did notice, it's like looking at the disease subtly, taking slices, brain slices, a living brain slices, and measuring immediate fast uh, release of dopamine uh, using voltammetry, so stimulating the slice and measuring uh, using carbon fiber electrode, the oxidation of dopamine, we see a major difference between the uh, homozygous, heterozygous, and, and wild-type mice, and that basically these uh, mutant animals have a propensity to pour out masses of dopamine, but only when they're stimulated. You have to actually stimulate the slice. And if you know about movement disorders and know about Parkinson's disease, you'll probably realize it's not really a movement disorder. It's a disorder of movement initiation. Right? The freezing that occurs, the festa, it's, it's the initiation. It's making that executive kind of uh, decision to, to go, no-go response uh, to, to a particular situation or circumstance. Um, once patients are arisen from a chair, they're fine. They're, once they start walking, they're fine. So it's, it's actually the initiation. So a lot of the biology has to be done in an activity-dependent context. We find that um, the presynaptic agonism to D2, um, these mice are actually more receptive to that uh, rather than less. They're more primed to that. And then looking at microdialysis, so basically sticking in a, a cannula into the brain of the animals and measuring neurotransmitter release in real time, we find no differences between the animals, wild type, hat, and homo. And, um, but we do see an increase in metabolites. So basically, the, um, this is not a very sensitive technique. Uh, basically, it's the release of dopamine over a period of an hour rather than millisecond time. And uh, so it's not really surprising that you're seeing really the consequences of metabolism of that. We looked at nigel Strato markers. This is the... Uh, um, the nigra did stereology. There's no difference in, in cell uh, numbers and things like this. We looked at innovation in the striatum, no differences again. But what we do find, it's pretty, pretty sweet, um, is a 100% increase in the vesicular monoamine transporter. So this is the vesicle, basically, um, that packages dopamine in the dopaminergic neuron and primes it ready for release, ready for excitosis. And in these particular animals, they have 100% more of this at, um, at all time points. And we also see, um, I'm sure what's on the slide there. <coughs> we also see um, um, similar increases um, by immunohistochemistry. This is just protein biochemistry. Um, and we also see decreases in the dopamine transport of getting the dopamine back into those neurons. So it comes back to a very, um, very nice. Um, thesis by George Ewell back in 98 that I remember reading uh, around the selective vulnerability of dopaminergic neurons uh, basically being a push and pull between the production of dopamine and its regulation, how it's produced, its excitosis, and then its endocytosis, and then its recycling uh, within the presynaptic terminals to do this all over again. Right? And um, that's basically what we see in these animals. The nice thing about it is that we can rescue these phenotypes and uh, we did this experiment, this is kind of cute, I'm not sure how much of you will be interested in knowing, but uh, we did this experiment and, and basically we've used competitive LERC2 kinase inhibitors uh, on VPS35 neurons um, and we can, we can rescue their, uh, um, uh, the uh, electrophysiologic properties of, of these cells um, because we now appreciate that VPS35 is immediately downstream of LERC2. LERC2 regulates the trafficking of VPS35. So it's, it's a really nice discovery in the sense that we've, uh, we've now found all of the biologic, uh, um, all the biology that we've done in the VPS35 mice, basically looking at the dopaminergic system, um, which is very robust, uh, we can treat with LERC2 kinase inhibitors and get a very nice readout of, of uh, uh, of, of whether they're working or, whether, or, 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 or how, how they might be improved. The, um, just moving on last, uh, this is a new gene for Parkinson's disease. We did, just described it in, um, in August. It's called DNAJC12. Um, it's in two families. It's an early onset form of Parkinsonism. This patient was actually 13 years of onset, um, and uh, this is done through comparative exome sequencing. And by sharing data, uh, for this rare form of Parkinsonism across the world. This is in a Canadian family, this is an Italian family, and it's a null mutation that basically knocks out uh, the, the gene. Um, and it turns out now we realize, I realize, and I think the world will start to realize pretty soon, there's actually five DNA uh, J C type proteins that are implicated in Parkinson's disease in the dopamine vesicle cycle. And they've all come through human genetic studies, uh, uh, classical Mendelian genetics for the most part. Um, so there's DNA GC5, 12, 13, um, 6, and 26. And they're all involved in either the exocytosis and release or the endocytosis and recycling 
of, of dopamine vesicles, which is, is quite phenomenal, really. I think a lot of um, interest for drug companies. Uh, I'll leave you with a couple of other, the last couple of slides. This is um, my thesis, basically, and, and from human genetic approach of working with these families and populations around the world, that Parkinson's disease really is, is a deficit uh, of um, endosomal recycling in uh, synapses, for the most part. You get a lot of secondary phenomena, like uh, Lewy body pathology, for example, that occurs um, as a consequence of this deficit, uh, this chronic deficit over time. Uh, but basically, it's a, uh, all of these proteins you can find decorating um, synapses very, very nicely. Um, I was going to show you a video, but I won't. The, um, this is the group. And, um, and I hope, um, and this is my view from my back window, um, but <laughs> the, uh, I hope um, what I wanted to impart to you is that you know, this has my, been my journey in Parkinson's disease, uh, basically working with families, traveling around the world, going to this population isolates, mapping disease etiology, and then trying to figure out how it fits together, uh, to modeling it uh, to try and find out what fundamentally those gene mutations do, and all with a view of lowering the bar for pharmaceutical companies to get invested, right? to get invested, to make that investment, and, uh, and uh, to take it to the next level, to spend the billion dollars on the trial, which would be necessary to... Uh, to probably um, make these medications from these uh, uh, disease uh, from these gene findings um, mainstream, um, I think it's going to be a similar challenge for uh, for most uh, neurologic disorders probably. But, um, but anyway, I'll leave you with that. And uh, thanks very much.